Welcome to the Industry Show. I'm your host, Nitin Bajaj, and joining me today is Kenny Dewan. Kenny, welcome on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Pleasure is all ours. So let's start with who is Kenny? Well, my name is you know, Kenny Dewan. I've been in business for about 31 years and uh, had the good fortune to start this business in 2012. I'm the founder of this company and, uh, and also the number one fan of our a clinical team. You know, I love that. I don't really see a lot of people saying that out loud. Of course, they they should be, but you're the first person I have come across that, you know, announces himself as the number one fan of the team. Let me go back, actually, tell you sure. that there were a couple of choices with that title. The other title was the head cheerleader. Yes. We passed it around, actually, with my leadership, is mm -hmm. which would be a better suited title for me the head cheerleader or the number one fan? I preferred the head cheerleader, but it seems that the leadership of Kukua wanted me to stick with number one fan. Just wanted to throw that out. I echo the choice. I love it. Tell us what, what is Akua? Akua Mind Body, which is our brand name, uh, mm -hmm. our company name is Akua Behavioral Health, mm -hmm. uh, operates 17 facilities today. Uh, half of them are for primary mental health and the other half are from substance abuse, which is addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, these are people who are, who are rec you know, trou troubled in life. When it comes to addic addiction, they've hit their rock bottom. And when it comes to primary health, these are people who are stepped below a locked up facility. Uh, they need 24 seven care um, and are struggling with quite a few different, different things. And they usually spend between 30 to 60 days with us, uh, pretty much monitored every 15 to 20 minutes. Wow, so pretty much in, in intense care, uh, recovering and hopefully continuing to stay recovered from the challenges they're facing. Uh, and, and that is the key there. You know, when you yeah. say continue to stay recovered in recovery, uh, somebody told me the other day, uh, and I can relate to it, that being having a successful recovery from hardcore drug addiction today is almost as difficult as being uh, going to work for NASA. <laughs> that is how challenging, difficult it is when it comes to the mind. The mind has to, has to be so strong. Well, physically, yes, we have to be strong, but the mind has to be so strong to go through that journey. It's very challenging. So what we do is we create the environment and provide the clinical therapy for somebody to do that. But they have to be motivated. It's almost impossible to, to work with someone if they're not. True, and I think environment is key. Even, uh, even as we look at it, uh, if, if we consider ourselves somewhat functioning, the stimulus, the constant you know, bombardment, whether it's social media, work, emails, texts, it's hard to, you know, keep your sanity. That's true. That is true. It, it, it's very difficult. And, and that's just for the regular population. But the people that we deal with are far more troubled. The, yes. they, they need help. They need uh, counseling, therapy, uh, w need to work with people who really understand the mental aspect of it. Um, it it's very challenging. And, and, it, and if the, the environment is not good, if the supportive environment where they live and and at least go through that initial part which is 60 days if it's not the right it, it, it's a journey which is almost impossible and it, it tends to fail very quickly fall apart you're really setting the foundation for them right and the those 60 days are really kind of make or break if you don't set the right foundation for them to build upon it's it's going to relapse they're going to not yeah. succeed right you know if you speak to people who have been in an industry for 20 plus years at the clinical level, uh, they will tell you that uh, to have a fair chance of recovery, you need minimum 180 days, hmm. which is about six months. And, and that creates a, a good basis to, to have a successful recovery. Unfortunately, in our, in a, in our, our, in our healthcare system, the money is not there. The money is the financial ability is not there. 
Our company is purely driven by insurance. We are 98, 97% insurance based. We are a you know, healthcare provider that is an HMO level type of company. And we have contracted with all the large payers and, and uh, the payers are struggling with this too. They, they give approvals in that seven, 15, 30 day window periods, fully knowing that, that uh, not enough. <laughs> that's a band-aid. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So let's, you know, before we uh, discuss some of the challenges, uh, let's kind of get a better sense. You mentioned you have uh, 17 facilities. Tell us a little more about the size and scale of the operations, uh, maybe even the number of, uh, I would call them customers uh, you see on a daily basis and uh, a little more about uh, your staff and team. Well, we have 17 facilities uh, spread across California, Northern and Southern California. Uh, we have over 320 odd employees uh, mm -hmm. working at all different levels from doctors, physicians, Clinic, clinical therapist and, and KDAC managers. Um, we, we do all levels of care. So starting from detox to inpatient to uh, PHP, which is partial hospitalization and then to outpatient. Uh, we also have created a very successful program called first responders treatment mm -hmm. uh, that only caters to people in the VA, active military, uh, firemen, policemen, believe it or not, that's a, that's a huge segment of population that needs our help. So that's kind of where we are. We continue to grow every year. We add about three or four facilities. Um, our, our biggest strength is our culture. Uh, this is something when I founded the company, uh, I saw that um, this, this business is about people treating people. And, and the key is that if the, if the people who are providing the treatment, which are the employees, if they're not happy, if they're not comfortable with the environment that they are working, uh, the, the outcome will never be right. And so we focused on that right from day one. And, and thankfully we build a good culture where people feel good about working at Akua. A lot of them are not even financially driven. They're driven by the work that they do. And, and, and I think that has a direct impact on outcome. So that way we're doing well. But you know, the culture is something which is a relative term. So there is no, there's no guideline as to where we stop. So we continue to build it every day. Uh, and, and that's, I would say, I, I spend a good, you know, one third of my time just focused on the culture with my leadership and getting it better to a higher level every day. Kudos to you for what you have done for that vision for knowing what is important. And like you rightly said, you know, to be able to give, you need to have. And uh, so thanks for doing what you do. And I know you wrote a book about the uh, company's culture and uh, you're really passionate about that so maybe you know if you can give us a, a bit of a highlight on that that would absolutely. be great absolutely i wish i had a, I had a book cover around but anyway the book is called it was published last month so it's it's new yeah, thank you for, pl for the plugin uh and it's called it's all about business culture and that's kind of what i said you know in our business it's all about the culture but it i think transcends to other businesses also today i think the greatest challenge is that most businesses are having today as people the motivation and and you know getting the people to feel good about where they are and, and be able to you know put in 100 percent. and so uh you know covid came last year and i i wanted to pin down my thoughts and and it was a scared time for me you know uh, uh covid was unexpected we did not know how to handle it and uh, i for one was scared uh how how badly will this impact us so you know it gave me a chance to reflect and you know how we are as human beings when when, um, when challenging times come, we start to think. And, and that, that's how it happened. I started writing this book and uh, worked for a wonderful editor. Uh, it's received a great response. We published it last, last month. And uh, so far we've had healthcare leaders and business leaders have just wonderful things to say about the book and buying it in, in multiple copies to share it with their leadership. Uh, it's available on Amazon and it's called it's all about the business culture. My name, Kenny Devon. If you just go punch it in, in, in Amazon, you'll find it there. Yeah, and I will make sure to include the link, uh, you know, with the flyers and, and when the show gets out. So it's an excellent book. I know I've, I've seen a lot of uh, leaders read it and post rave reviews because I think people realize it, but when they see the importance and the amount of time and passion someone has given to it and has seen the results, 
it's hard to deny. I, I, so, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I feel the same. I feel the same. We, we received a very good positive response. And, and even though I, I mostly talk about my business, I talk about a journey from 2012 to where we are today. Uh, I, I've had a lot of business leaders who run larger companies with 1,000 plus employees. Uh, they've read the book and they said, Kenny, absolutely. I can take lessons from this directly to what I do every day and what my leadership does every day. Thank you. This this is a great connection. So, yes, so far, so you know, it's it's been real good. Congratulations again on the book, and uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with the wider community. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you know where where we kind of were in terms of the challenges or the biggest challenge you're facing as a business. The COVID COVID has. So think about it this way, you know, we, we used to have op- anywhere around 25 to 30 open positions every day, mm-hmm. pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, during COVID, it went up a little, but now that we are in this kind of stage where we kind of are out of COVID, but we still have different variants coming, we have anywhere around 50 plus open positions every day. Oh. So here we are struggling just to fill our positions but at the same time, we are motivating our employees to be happy and excited to come to work mm-hmm. and, and, and still deal with the struggles that they might have on their normal day life. So think about a mom who has two kids and, and for six months, she did not know where, you know, she should, whether she should hire a babysitter or she should put the kid in a daycare. Would that be safe? Or even send the kids to school because they were half the cities and counties that were not, not clear about that school messaging. So our biggest challenge moving forward, it has been like that, but I think COVID has made it more difficult, Mm -hmm. um, is to motivate the current people to come to work and be happy about, attract new talent. That's very important in our industry, uh, how we separate ourselves, who we are, what we do, why we different, why this is a comfortable place to come and work, why it's a great career to be at in in our industry, at our company. Uh, And at the same time, you know, uh, be able to attract people who might not be comfortable working at other places which might not have a good culture. Yeah. You know, they, they, they might have the skill set and they might be passionate about their work, but they might be in a, in a wrong place. So that, that's the other reason I think creating this book, creating my podcast, which is Dancing with Kenny, yeah. is our greatest challenge. It's our people. Yeah, they're your asset, but at the same time, you know, these are strange times. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, again, you know, kudos for staying on top of that and doing what you can to attract the best and then keep them and grow with them. So congratulations. Uh, on the flip side of challenges come opportunities. And, uh, you know, the let me get a sense from you on what is the biggest opportunity that you as a leadership uh, team at Akua are targeting right now? Well, the demand is there. So the demand has always been there for, for primary mental health and for substance abuse. The demand has always been there from the day I got into the business in 2012 to today. The gap between demand and supply is huge, absolutely huge. Sadly, the, the healthcare industry, number one, the federal and the state governments, number two, have not figured out Mm-hmm. how to create a structure where they can provide enough money to providers like ourselves to continue to expand our, our services and mm-hmm. our treatment facilities for the mass scale. So for example, we only take commercial insurance, right? Mm-hmm. We don't take Medicare, Medi-Cal, medi And I think until the time that there's a structure, there's enough financial help for the providers like us, you will see a very large percentage of uh, people who need our services cannot access our services. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's kind of where things are right now. So it's an opportunity to fix things, but it's an opportunity also to care for millions, millions of people who need, who need our help who need this, this treatment, but are not able to get it. So I think there's a true opportunity, but I think it has to start from the federal and the state level and then be piggybacked by the insurance companies. 
True. And uh, the sooner that can happen, the sooner we can heal as a community. For sure. For sure. You know, and some of this has to do with the homeless population. I mean, yes. a lot of them actually, if they were provided the opportunity to get the treatment, you might not see so many of them on the streets. Exactly. But, you know, they, they did not have the right insurance. The Medicare, Medi-Cal does not have a system to be able to provide the right type of environment, treatment, facility, days required. And, and some of these people are just, uh, they go from bad to worse. And that's why you see them on the streets. Yeah, it's a downward spiral. And if we can plug it, the sooner and earlier we can plug it, it can prevent a lot of the downstream For negatives. Sure. For sure. For sure. Kenny, when you look back, and uh, in the rear view mirror, right, you, you've been a, a career professional, a leader for, uh, for a while. What is a success story that you're really proud of and a lesson learned, you know, things that didn't work out as uh, you had planned? What are, what are one of each or, you know, even one of either of those examples that you would want to share with us? Well, there, there's a whole new book there, right? <laughs> because... <laughs> yes. Because I, I remember I, I got into business when I was 22 years old, right out of, I finished my master's MBA. And, and obviously, you know, as a business entrepreneur, whether you run a company where it's you by yourself or, you know, where I have 300 plus employees, either, either, either way, I think this, you learn something almost every day or every other day, yeah. whether it could be something small that you got to overcome or figure it out, or it's something far more great and challenging like the COVID, right? Uh, but, but the greatest thing, if I look back now, 31 years in business, 31, um, understanding how to work with people, understanding and recognizing the skill and the talent level that each person has. And I think that's the greatest quality of a business leader. If they can do that, I, 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 amazing amount of success that is directly proportional to that. All of us, each of us, you and me are not born with the same talent. We have different skill sets, right? Uh, and, and the sooner we figure out what our skill sets are, the better for us. But on the other side, as a business leader, uh, somebody who runs a company, operates a company at whatever level, if they have the ability to recognize that skill set and what that one person is passionate and feels good about doing, I think that's the key. That's the greatest lesson that I've not only learned, but continue to enhance and make it better. Uh, you know, sometimes you get it right away, meeting, meeting some person and working with them a little bit, and sometimes it takes longer. But by far, that is the, that is the greatest skill that I feel that I, I have been able to develop, but also if other leaders, uh, as they recognize, if they could enhance, I think that would be tremendously helpful because it, it's, it's all about people. It's all about your team. It's all about the people you work with. I love that. And thanks for sharing your wisdom because you know at the beginning you mentioned people are healing people and people do business with people and and you know this is all about one person and a team and a group and uh, people coming together so understanding what clicks for someone and what someone is good at and makes them happy i think that's the that's the magic right there sure Absolutely. I feel so too. And then, you know, just quickly, I don't know how much time we have, but I want do want to plug in my podcast here, Dancing with Kenny. I don't know if you see that on that screen. You yes. know, about a year, almost two years ago, I started this podcast just for my own team members, my employees, mm -hmm. all, all 300 plus of them. I do it twice a month for 30 minutes and it's a feel good show. It's a feel good show where anybody, anybody at any level, level of the company can join us for 30 minutes and they can share a story. And, and we share success stories because, you know, truly it's a success when you take somebody from where they are yes. and, and get them on, on recovery to really live a life that they were born to live. Mm -hmm. it, it's truly a successful because some of these people, you know, literally are, are at the dead end when they come to us. Mm -hmm. And so it's a feel good show. We all feel good about each other and we, we share stories and, uh, and we bring a guest from the, our industry to also share their thoughts and, and whatever shares they have. And at the end of the, show we actually dance we put on some music we dance you know uh, and the reason i call it dancing with kenny even though i'm a terrible dancer by the way <laughs> i have a broken leg um but uh but dancing creates happiness yes and dancing creates good feelings right and and that was the whole idea it was a feel-good show it truly is and and as that as long as i can make people smile at the end of the show 
and be happy, a little more motivated to go back to work, I feel I've accomplished something. So but that's a good thing you got to do. Well, you're making me smile ear to ear. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the one thing that I've always believed in is I've always been customer first, customer focused, and wanting to delight my customers. Now, when your customer is someone whose life you're going to change for the better, for the rest of their lives, like you said, you know, make them live the life they were born to live. That's a huge accomplishment and, and you need to celebrate and kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Feel good about that. Yes. You, you know, sure? I, I always say this to people that this is the third different industry that I've <laughs> been part of in, in, my, in my business life, you know, 10 years each, 31 years now. My first 10 years was in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I made speakers for Infinity and JBL. I had two factories over 150 mm -hmm. people working with me for me. And, and that was great. And then the second part was real estate development, where I put medical office buildings and retail and even went to North Dakota to build housing for, for the oil industry. And that was great. It was a great adventure. But this is the first time. This is the first time with this company called Akua, where I'm doing more than making money. And, mm -hmm. and that's the key. I sleep well at night. It's, 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 it's I'm giving back, you know, in some form or the other, I play a small role. Obviously, I don't do the amazing work that my team members do every day, which is very, very challenging. But I, I create the platform for them to be able to do that. And that I feel I feel good about that. And, and hopefully, you know, uh, looking back, I can say, hey, I, I did more than just running a business. I did more than just making money. And, and, and th that's sometimes important in life, too. You know, uh, money is not everything. <laughs> and if you're following your heart, you're following your passion, the money will come. Right? Yes. And, and you know this, sure. but, uh, you know, again, thanks for your humility. And uh, I think you should take a little more credit than you. <laughs> <laughs> Wife gives me no credit. Absolutely zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's entitled to it. She, yeah. she shouldn't. <laughs> so, Kenny, let's let's talk, get to know you a little better. And the way we do that is through some one line life lessons and uh, would love to hear some that uh, you have for us today. Okay. Will you be asking me the questions or, or just? Stage is yours. So, you know, if you can share a one line life lesson and give us a little bit of context around it, how it came to you or how you came to define it or how it has changed you. Uh, you know, these are uh, points in, in our lives where we tend to learn something or come, come up with something, you know, uh, and then kind of pen them down and that tends to shape our well, future to come. Yeah, well, here's one, you know, that, that I, I have, I'm still struggling with and I'm still mm -hmm. learning about is how to be a friend to my two grown up adult children. <laughs> my, my daughter is 23. Uh, she graduated from USC about a year ago. And she works for Oracle now. Nice. And my, my son is a senior at USC, uh, you know, trying to work with large consulting companies. but. About a year and a half ago, I actually sat down with them, with my wife present, and I said to them, I said, you know, I'm not sure whether I've been a good dad or a bad dad in the past, um, but whatever I, I was as a dad to you is over. Moving forward, I do not want to be your dad. I want to be your friend. Awesome. I, I want to be your friend, and in whichever capacity you feel comfortable, because, you know, they're different, the age is different, they have a different set of friends. And, and I'm still working towards being a good friend mm -hmm. to my two adult kids, uh, Ria and Kavi. Uh, I take that same lesson with, with my leadership team. You know, we have a wonderful leadership team at Akua. Uh, you know, if I can be their friend, if I can create a relationship where I'm a support to them, mm -hmm. and I think uh, I, it's a lesson that I'm that I'm continuing going to learn, get better at. Uh, it's at the end of the day, it's all about people, and it's all about the, yes. the relationships that you have with people, and that's a that's a huge lesson for me uh, that I've learned. The the other one that I I would love to share with you is called love and respect. You know, I I truly mm -hmm. believe that the more love and respect you give out, the more you will get, and and you will create an environment around you where you want to feel good and live. And, and, and it's important to, for me, as, as I grow older, to, to operate in that environment. You know, it's very important for me to, to, to be able to 
reciprocate love and respect. And I think it starts from you, from yourself. If you, if you give that out, you will get that back. And, and uh, I think those are the two most important lessons for me. How to be a friend, not only to my family, to my kids, to my wife, but also my, to my real friends. You know, how can I be a real friend? And the other one is the love and respect. I think I I read a third one there, which is being true to yourself. Right? Oh. And I think that's where this comes from, this that you want to provide and uh, give that kind of an environment where people can be themselves and hence open up those gates where you can build those relationships. Because friendship, you know, you need to be uh, you need to be open, you need to be transparent. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know if you surround yourself with good people, you yes. learn so much from them. You know, there's an old saying, you know, if you surround with yourself with five people who are smarter than you, yes. that that's the best way to learn more. And and you know, I try to do the same. I'm I'm just amazed at the humility, and you know, you've you've achieved a lot. Like you said, I don't know many people who have gone in completely different industries and been successful, and uh, you know, I, I think that's there's a lot to be said about the knowledge, the wisdom that uh, you have gained. And and, and, I, and I want to share something very interesting yeah. with you that, you know, because a lot of, uh, you know, this country gives us a lot of opportunity, yes. right? We come here from, a lot of us come from India, uh, where, where we go to good schools, we get trained well, we get educated well, we learn how to speak English even before we get land here. So that I think gives us the the skill set to, to, do, to do well in this country. But, but the opportunity that this country opens up for people like you and me is absolutely amazing. It's absolutely yes. amazing. I mean, I, you know, my, my father was in the army. He was a brigade in the army. So we lived a grand life, but mm -hmm. we never had the wealth. You know, right. we never had the money. And, and I think he sold his property to buy me a ticket to come get here, to get to the U.S. And I was a, I was a sub-average student, terrible in studies, never paid attention in class. So unlike most Indians who come to the U.S., right, most come, they go to very good engineering schools or they're doctors and, and they already have a very good foundation by the time they get here and they go to wonderful MBA schools or go to work for the Fortune 500. My path was not the same. My path was a little different where my father saw me who got 55% in this country. That's what I stood, 55. And my mother was still happy. She was still happy that I passed, right? Uh, but he, my dad was a pretty smart guy. And he said, Kenny, uh, with, with the grades that you have, the worst college in Delhi will also not take you. <laughs> Fact, they will not take you. So you, my son, have absolutely zero future in India. You, whatever little skill set you have, I think it'll be better off in the US. So let's figure out a way how to get you on a plane to go there and see. Maybe it'll work out and maybe you'll not. So it's a huge risk for a guy who only has one child, right? I'm the only child. He doesn't have any other ones. So it's a risk he, he had to take. So he took that risk. He sold this piece of land, collected enough money. We And by the way, me and my dad sat down and we applied to the 10 cheapest schools in US. We had no money, right? We had no money. So we, we were not looking for the best. We were looking for the cheapest. And so we found one in Iowa that was cheap. And they even gave me a little financial aid. I don't know how they did that. Uh, but I got here and and suddenly the, the light bulb went off, right? It's like, dude, I'm here. Mm -hmm. and, and all I've got is $400 in my pocket. Yeah. And if I don't figure this out, this is it. And so I think that was the turning around. I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so went back, went from a very average student who didn't pay attention to academics to suddenly, hey, I got to maintain my GPA to get the financial aid. Mm -hmm. And and suddenly the hunger came. And and uh, so I give, give some credit to my dad there, who was just brilliant and smart for me to do that. But I also give a lot of credit to this country, the wonderful country that we live in the United States of America, we, it's so much great opportunity for someone, for anyone, for an immigrant to come and, and work here. I, I don't know how much you, how time you have, but I want to share a story with you Please. about Ronald Reagan. And, and you can look this up in the internet, so it's, mm -hmm. it's out there on YouTube. But, uh, but the last day when Ronald Reagan was leaving his office after his eight years, he had a meeting with his staff members. And of course, there was some press there too. And he said, he said, I want to share a story with all of you. He said that in my travels before I became the president, uh, I met this guy in Germany and, and uh, 
you know, he, he struck me because he spoke wonderful things and did wonderful things in his life. Uh, but he said, he says, Ronald, I want to tell you the best year of my life. The best year, I'm 73 years old, but the best one year of my life was in the United States of America. Mm. And, and Ron said, well, why did you leave? He says, because I was in prison. Mm. I, was, I was in World War II and I was brought to prison in the US. I was in prison. I was a prisoner of war. And that year I spent in, in America and that was the best year of my life. Mm. And that is so beautiful, right? Wow. That, that we had this wonderful opportunity to live and work in this country that is so, so mm -hmm. open to every culture, to every immigrant coming here and, and let us live and work and raise our families. And, and that, that one quote by Ronald Reagan, that one little story I always share with people that, you know, there's this great opportunity here and it's up to us what we want to do with it. So true. I mean, the story obviously is beautiful, but your own story is phenomenal. Like you said, most people I come across have that, you know, typical came from India, studied hard, went to good schools and and set that platform. But it explains a lot about you where, you know, you've been able to go in, figure things out and then, you know, make success out of nothing. So can you thank you for being with us today? Thank you for sharing your story, your journey and your lessons. We really appreciate it. We would love to continue this conversation, bring you back on. And uh, again, want to mention the book. Uh, we will make sure that it's out there and linked in the comments. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you for having me here. Would love to come back again. And, and good luck with your show. I've heard only good, wonderful reviews about your show and good, good luck with everything. Thank you, Kenny.